The Synod on the Family continues. The Pope talks to Paris Match. And we meet the youngest Synod participant. Hello and welcome to another edition of Vatican Connections. Now the Synod of Bishops on the Family continues in Rome, so let's take a look at what's been going on. But first, Pope Francis sat down with a journalist from the French magazine Paris Match. Among the topics discussed was the upcoming Jubilee Year for Mercy. Asked how he came up with the idea, he said that since Paul VI, the Church has emphasized the mercy of God. So reflecting on this and on, and on how each Pope since then has spoken about mercy, he said the idea came to him that it would be beautiful to have an extraordinary jubilee for mercy. Also asked about how he deals with celebrating Mass with a congregation of millions, he said he prays every day for the grace to remain in the presence of Christ. He added that when a priest says Mass, it's not before congregation, but before Christ, and the bigger the congregation, the more important it is to remember that. Asked about China, he said, China is in my heart. Now, turning to the Synod, despite some good conversations and good work done on the topics on the agenda, the story that stole the spotlight early in the week was the so-called Lettergate incident. Briefly, 13 cardinals wrote a letter to Pope Francis telling him about some concerns they had with the methodology of the synod. The letter was leaked to the Italian press along with the names of 13 cardinals who reportedly signed it. But within hours, four cardinals denied that they had signed the letter, while others said they had signed a letter, but the content of the letter they signed was not the same as what the Italian media reported. Cardinal Timothy Dolan spoke about that letter, which he signed on the Catholic Channel. He said he and 12 other cardinals, who had some concerns again about the new synod process, decided to share those concerns with the Pope because, quote, Pope Francis asked us to be open and honest. The Pope addressed their concerns on the first day of the synod, and as far as those 13 cardinals were concerned, the issue was resolved. So the leaking of the letter is little more than a media distraction, or as Vatican spokesperson Father Federico Lombardi said, quote, a deliberate attempt to disturb the Synod. Now a good portion of the week at the Synod was spent in the small working groups. Synod participants are divided into language groups to discuss different sections of the working document. They eventually make proposals about those items which they submit to the committee that will draft the final message. Cardinal Vincent Nichols talked this week about some of the issues being grappled with as the small groups look towards that final document. The temptation which has been around all this year is that somehow there is a conflict between justice and mercy and that somehow mercy always as it were, replaces justice. So under the appeal of mercy, the church may say to people, it doesn't matter what you do, it's fine. Uh, it doesn't matter. But that's a profound misunderstanding of the relationship between justice and mercy. My hope certainly is uh, that the Pope will uh, reflect and uh, issue an exhortation or uh, a magisterial document. That request is beginning to come through, I think, in the debates. Um, my own instinct is that the Holy Father has asked us and encouraged us to speak very freely uh, because he is very clear about his own role. And secondly, I think my instinct is that he has established the Jubilee Year of Mercy precisely to create the context into which uh, his reflections or his definitive statements about the theme of this synod can be received. So my hope is certainly that he will uh, complete this process 
because it seems to me that it will need bringing to a conclusion. And there's only one person who can do that. Another major area of discussion is the language that is used to talk about the situations that families face. A lot of people in the hall are saying, let's, as we prepare documents, use language which is inspiring and which is hopeful. Even if there's something which is against church teaching, we put it in such a way that we're being friendly to them, we're being helpful to them and being supportive. It's not denying any, any teaching or any doctrine, but just saying, look, we're here to, to help you, to work with you. In recent years with the, the sexual revolution and um, people who are of the same sex and attracted to one another coming out publicly is, is much more prevalent today than, than even just a few decades ago. So it's, it's an issue that people have to, to talk about and, and it's an issue that families struggle with, really struggle with. Such people need to be respected, you know, not, not condemned but be respected. If this is, if this is their, orient, their sexual orientation, then we have to respect them and try somehow, and no one's too sure how, but to, to include them in the, in the life of the church. When we have documents which talk about um, intrinsically disordered or, or being evil, that's not going to help people. You know, we've got to find a way to express what the teaching actually says, but not putting it in ways that people feel that they're being branded and they're being told that they're bad or evil. Scripture was written for a particular time, Paul was writing about particular issues. And so for people just to pick up something and, and even for, for church authorities to quote something without putting it in context is, is not helpful for people. I just hope that something will come out in the final document that helps people to see, and I'm sure that's what Pope Francis is trying to do, just trying to help people to see that the church is here to, to support and assist them and, and especially um, when there's some area, whether it's an area of sexual morality or some other difficulty in their families that they're struggling with. Certainly one of the points of difference is, is cultural groupings. Uh, and that's of course inevitable. Um, our faith is an incarnate faith and we live it in different cultures. And from that arises the question of language. I think it's fair to say that there's a, an honesty, a recognition uh, the word used today in one um, summary was church speak. Uh, it is struggling to communicate to perhaps particularly those people who we might term on the periphery. Uh, and therefore, if we have as, a, as a, an objective uh, a desire to better communicate with those people, then we have to be careful about the language that we use. We can't assume people understand uh, some phrases, some terminology that would be natural for us. And that's why freshness of language is so important. But language, of course, is just one challenge. As another Synod Father explained, the sheer size of the job and the number of the participants presents its own challenges. This Synod will be different from all other Synods, or from most Synods, in that mostly they uh, produce a, a series of points or propositions. This one we seem to be working on editing a text. And so I think that's a very difficult thing to do under the time pressures in which we find ourselves. Um, something, I, I don't know a way around that, when you try to get well, almost 300 people editing a text, it's very difficult to do in a very short piece of time. And I, my understanding is that, uh, and I may be wrong on this, that once we finish the third section, there's going to be a very brief time for the committee established by the Holy Father to uh, put it all together, produce an Italian text, we read it, we vote on it, and then hand it to the Holy Father. I'm not sure this process, and I, I think what we want to give to the Holy Father and give to the world, because I assume people are going to be reading this text. It won't just be the Holy Father receives it privately and will read it. So it's really, a, on a sense, a public text uh, that I would hope that the people of the Church and the Holy Father deserve a really good text. And it's, um, I think we all want to produce that. 
uh, something of, of great quality and of depth to serve the people. But it's hard to do it um, in, in such an intense period. And I don't know if there's a better way of doing it, but in any case, it is, it's difficult. So there, when people see whatever is produced at the end, I hope they keep that in mind, that this thing is put together very, very quickly. And there may be things which, uh, you know, thinking about it for a few weeks, people might say, well, maybe we should have uh, phrased it differently or done it differently. Of course, there are a few non-Synod things happening too. A much-awaited homeless shelter opened at the Vatican this week. The Gift of Mercy shelter was created and funded by the Papal Almoner, and it is run by the Missionaries of Charity. Now, it can provide shelter for 34 men. Because of the limited number of beds, the maximum stay is 30 days. All guests have to agree to abide by the structured schedule that sees them rising at 6.15 for breakfast. In the evening, they have to be in by 7 p.m. Guests get access to the shower and barber facilities in St. Peter's Square, and meals are provided by another shelter in the neighborhood run also by the Missionaries of Charity. And one cardinal celebrated a large milestone this week. Cardinal Loris Capovilla, the former secretary to Pope John XXIII, turned 100. Issues around language and logistics were at the forefront of the Synod this week, and with some of those issues comes culture and context to be considered. Just as different parts of the world identify different issues as their challenges, the possible solutions and initiatives put forward by the Synod won't work in all cultural contexts. So here's what Synod participants had to say about that. This has come up many times, many interventions in the aula have developed the topic that there should be a delegation, an authorization of dealing with issues, at least pastorally, in different ways according to the cultures. I think I've heard something like that at least 20 times in, t in the interventions, whereas only about two or three have spoken against it, sort of affirming that uh, the unity of the church needs to be maintained also in all these regards and that it would be fatal to go into a, uh, such a delegation of authority. I'm from Germany and uh, it seems to me that, for example, the, the question of remarried, divorced and remarried people or who are divorced and are living again in a stable union with children is felt very strongly and very broadly in the German Catholic public. It seems to be much less of a concern and elsewhere, and that seems to me an area where maybe regional pastoral solutions could be envisaged. I also have the impression that the understanding of homosexuality, the social acceptance of homosexuality, uh, is culturally very diverse, and there that seems to me very obviously also to be an area where bishops' conferences should be allowed to formulate pastoral responses that are in tune with what can be preached and announced and lived in, in a given context, for example. Um, there is certainly a move towards thinking that perhaps some issues would be better or maybe more easily dealt with at a local or regional level. And I think I could see there would be some advantages to that. At the same time, of course, it hasn't actually happened, or as Father Jeremias, Abbot Jeremias, excuse me, has been saying, there have been no votes on this. And looking to how the Universal Church has operated for so long, I think this will be a very interesting test to see if, in fact, that level of authority perhaps would be respected or even allowed. Because, frankly, although I can see advantages, I can also see disadvantages. Tell us a little bit about what you think might be, might be better handled on the local level. I think it's about, you know, the preparation to marriage. You know, we have in, in our Western societies, you know, the preparation of marriage. But most of the couples 
who come to us, you know, asking the marriage, are already living together. They are cohabiting. You know, they are living together. So uh, it's uh, it's different in Africa. In Africa, they uh, they have what they call, you know, the the marriage coutumier. I don't know how to explain it. in English. It's a, as a custom, you know. So it's part of of their process, you know. So uh, we don't have, you know, this situation uh, in 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 Canada or in uh, in the United States. So it's for the reason that uh, each, you know, uh, region or you know continent must deal with uh, these issues and find a way. As long as you know the on a universal point of view. We are in tune with, you know, the, the teaching of the church but on marriage. But on the other hand, we cannot, you know, uh, avoid the reality that the situations are diverse. And it's just an example of how, you know, we must uh, adapt to our local, our regional, or national situations. Francis, of course, took part in all the sessions of the Synod. Let's take a look at his weekly agenda. He was fully occupied with the ongoing Synod, and his on only break was on Wednesday for the general audience. CNS has more. Quanto siamo leali con le promesse che facciamo ai bambini facendole venire nel nostro mondo? Noi le facciamo venire al mondo. E questa è una promessa. Cosa le promettiamo loro? La grande promessa è amore. Questo è il modo più giusto di accogliere un essere umano che viene al mondo. E tutti noi lo impariamo, ancora prima di esserne consciente. A me piace tanto quando vedo i papà e le mamme e quando passo fra voi portarmi un bambino, una bambina piccolina, insomma, quanto tempo ha? Tre settimane, quattro settimane, ma e cerco che il Signore la benedica. Questo si chiama amore anche. I bambini vengono al mondo e si aspettano di avere conferma di questa promessa. Lo aspettano in modo totale, fiducioso, indefeso. Quando accade il contrario, i bambini vengono feriti da uno scandalo. Da uno scandalo insopportabile, tanto più gravi in quanto non hanno i mezzi per decifrarlo. No, non possono capire cosa succede. E vorrei aggiungere un'altra cosa con molto rispetto per tutti, ma anche con molta franchezza. La loro spontanea fiducia in Dio non dovrebbe mai essere ferita, soprattutto quando ciò avviene a motivo di una certa presunzione, più o meno inconscia, di sostituirci a Lui. Il tenero e misterioso rapporto di Dio con l'anima dei bambini non dovrebbe essere mai violato. È un rapporto reale che Dio lo vuole. Now, Pope Francis did not stick to the text for his general audience. Before starting, he actually took a moment to talk to the faithful about what has been happening in the church. La parola di Gesù è forte oggi, eh? Guai per, al mondo per gli scandali. Gesù è realista. E dice, è inevitabile che vengano scandali, ma guai all'uomo a causa del quale viene lo scandalo. 
Io vorrei, prima di iniziare la Catechesi, in nome della Chiesa, chiedervi perdono per gli scandali che in questi ultimi tempi sono caduti sia a Roma che in Vaticano. Vi chiedo perdono. And over the weekend, Pope Francis is scheduled to celebrate Mass for the canonization of Blessed Louis Martin and Zélie Guérin. They are the parents of St. Therese of Lisieux. As Pope Francis has pointed out, they are not being canonized because their daughter is a saint. Instead, their daughter is a saint because of their example. Synods are supposed to bring prelates and invited participants together for an experience where all are equal and equally open to the Holy Spirit. This time, one participant is drawing an unprecedented amount of attention, but it's actually very fitting considering the theme of the Synod. Now our team in Rome spoke to that participant, or rather, to his family. My name is Massimo, I'm married with Patrizia. This is Davide, the Synod baby. <laughs> he received a lot of blessing these days. Uh, we are married with 20 years and we have uh, 12 children. The oldest uh, is 19, he's studying at the university in Maastricht. The other is studying and uh, normal children. Eh? We are no so family, fantastic family, normal family with normal problems. But uh, the Lord help us uh, every day. Uh, it's very important to, to pass the faith to the next generation. We celebrate the Eucharist on Saturday evening and on Sunday morning we pray the morning prayer with the children. So we take a, a word of the Bible and we speak with them. Uh, are you okay? Uh, what, what about this week? Have you a problem in school? Are you in peace with all brothers and sisters? Do you have to ask uh, forgiveness? Because, and also we can ask forgiveness if we make a mistake, eh? sometimes. Uh, the Holy Father invite us. Um, we are itinerant of the neocatechumenal way. We live in the Netherlands as a missionary family. Yeah. So the Holy Father invite us and we have a baby, so he has to come with us. <laughs> Everyone wants to, to bless him, want to give him, uh, take a picture with us, with, you know, important cardinals. Uh, we ask to him, uh, to them, uh, can we take a picture with you? No, no, I have to take a picture with you because, no, it's very important. We are, we are very thankful uh, uh, to the Holy Father because uh, uh, to stay here is a big opportunity to bless God uh, for all the things the, that he made in our life. Uh, we start this way of Christian initiation and this is uh, a big uh, blessing for our life. We are very happy to have uh, 12 children. Uh, Paolo VI uh, made a great uh, encyclical with uh, Umane Vitae. Eh? And it's, it's not true that uh, the Umane Vitae is uh, last. Uh, it's, uh, it's an heavy thing that you have to... No, no, no. It's, uh, it's a grace, it's a really grace, yes. Now, we would like that will come uh, the, the light of the Christian family, uh, that the, this model of the Christian family will be uh, proposed uh, with uh, enthusiasm, with uh, a positive message. Well, that's all for this edition of Vatican Connections. Join us again next time where we bring you more coverage on the Synod. Until then, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook or check our blog for updates. From everyone here, thanks for watching. See you next time.